Today, I speak with Basement Bodybuilding, a hypertrophy enthusiast who is wise for his age. We talk about his favorite arm exercises, progressive overload, and why you can't be a passive lifter. All right, so I want to kick things off by talking about progressive overload. Something you've mentioned is that you came to the realization that you shouldn't rush progression and the logbook. I find this interesting because a lot of people just talk about pushing progressive overload at all costs. Can you maybe talk through that in as much detail as possible? Yeah, well, progressive overload is something that you you have to be aware of it, but I think you have to also keep it in moderation and in check. And that's not to say you shouldn't progress as fast as you can. You shouldn't train as hard as you can. But it's more that you can't let other things get out of balance when you push progression too hard because on paper, that's where progressive overload happens. That's how we know it's happening. And on paper, you can't tell if you sacrificed other certain variables to make that progression happen on paper. So an easy example for this would be the squat where let's say your goal is just to get to parallel and getting a little bit below parallel for your form is more stimulative and or maybe it gives you less fatigue. So it's just a better option overall to squat a little bit deeper. That's a pretty reasonable example in most cases, I'd say. With this, if you slowly shift your range of motion by cutting it at the bottom, you can keep adding weight and adding reps just because you're cutting your range of motion. So if progressive overload at all costs is your number one priority, you're bound to sacrifice other variables because you have incentive to do that. You're not focusing on the stimulus, you're focusing purely on the progression. So if you slowly move your squat a little bit higher, move your stance a little bit wider, maybe you switch from high bar to low bar, uh, or you just dive bomb your eccentrics, these are all little things that almost happen subconsciously when your pure focus is to just add reps at, at uh, reps or weight at any cost. So uh, that's one of those situations where you're just going to keep progressing, but it's at the expense of your stimulus that you're getting. And when you step back and look at the bigger picture, it's not the progressive overload. It's the stimulus that's causing your growth in the first place, because why, how would you progress? Why is progressive overload important? It's important because it's not forcing you to grow. You can't do things that you couldn't do yesterday without an adaptation. And the adaptation doesn't come from my body's used to this and then it did this and then it did this and now it just keeps growing. It's because you keep giving it this potent stimulus that forces it to grow. So another example, let's say on bench, if I can do 315 for seven and that's zero reps in reserve, I'm unable to get eight and I have to add a rep next week. Like, what am I going to do? I'm not just going to do eight. I have to do 315 for seven first, and that will give me the stimulus and growth. And then I come back bigger and stronger from a stimulative potent set. And now I can do eight. I'm not choosing to do eight because I have to do more. I have to get stimulus first, which is 315 for seven. Yeah, I find that really interesting because I know a lot of kind of like beginners and intermediates, they're chasing that number so hard that they either get depressed if they don't hit the number or they definitely sacrifice form and range of motion in order to hit it. And then it kind of becomes this, this feedback loop where it's like, okay, I got that last time, but I sacrificed. So next time I need to do even more. So like, and your, your body's not ready to handle it with good form. So then you're forced to sacrifice more and more over the course of time. Yeah, you corner yourself is essentially what happens. And yeah, you, you pigeonhole yourself. And that's why when you focus so much on progressive overload, that's why so many bodybuilders turn into powerlifters. And that's exactly what happened to myself. Because I couldn't see progressive overload on my curls as fast as I could, at least on squat bench deadlift with hyper optimized technique for lifting the most weight I possibly could. I didn't see as much progression training in slightly higher rep ranges, obviously in weight than I would training in low rep ranges. So if progressive overload is all that matters, why wouldn't you train like a power lifter? Because they're going to get the biggest numbers. They're going to see the most progressions on paper. But ultimately, it doesn't really work like that. Because even if you're adding, if you're adding, say, five pounds a month to a deadlift, that's in your deadlifting 500 pounds, you're adding, what would that be, 1% <laughs> weight every month? But if you're curling 100 pounds, and you add five pounds, now you're adding 5% every month, and that's just not sustainable. So 
you probably have to add one pound a month it, in in a perfect world if everything just works perfectly in in proportions and numbers like that but that's where you have less incentive to work muscles and lifts that just don't put up as much weight and in reality there's no logical reason why uh, lifts that you can see more progression on and technically like are more progressively overloadable which is a, i think some one of the most overrated terms uh or variables in lifting that that's just why people bias those big lifts so much because you can progress on them for much longer quote unquote and how did you get away from that because obviously you were putting up you know pretty good numbers in the big three and then having to move to you know focusing on isolation lifts where maybe you couldn't progress um as quickly I feel like there's a mental barrier there. Like how did you, you know, mentally adjust to oh, that yeah. new reality? Yeah, that's actually, that's probably the, one, of the mo one of the most interesting parts about it because I, I had to take time off of lifting. Like I had to quit lifting because I felt like I cornered myself and I couldn't, I, I just didn't have, you get so attached to your numbers. Like if I was used to doing 295 for triples on bench, I, there's just no way I could go to, 260 for sets of seven with better technique like you, the your mind just can't handle that it seems like regression and it just you can't get hyped up when you're training sub maximally like that so what i had to do just to sum it up i guess is i had to take time off of lifting because i just i couldn't enjoy lifting i had no no incentive to go back into the gym because i still i tricked myself into only caring about progression and i had to take time off and kind of wait for that kick instinctually that I, I just love lifting and I knew it would come back at some point. So about four or five, six months later, I kind of got that kind of got that kick, got that itch to get back into the gym. And I just kind of restarted with my initial just goals that were purely my own. I took time out of the fitness industry and just came back purely as myself and focused on just basically obliterating each muscle the best that I could. Uh, and it's just been, it's been good training since then. I haven't really gotten carried away with strength or anything. I, I have a pretty solid philosophy and that's, that's what I've been trying to share on the channel. So if you do the same weights and reps, let's say on like a bicep isolation, two or three weeks in a row, I guess, what's the mental talk that you have yourself where you know, it's still a good session? Uh, just the, the proximity to failure is probably the the biggest one. So I wouldn't focus too, too much on the feeling, the sensation. So a lot of people say, oh, if I got a good pump, that's a good session. If it, if I had a good mind muscle connection, that's a good session. I think that's kind of the other end of the extreme. It's almost like the polar opposite of being super performance oriented. But I would say, and this is what I try and tell my clients too. They're like, oh, well, I didn't progress. I didn't make progress. I'm like, well, that's not true. Did you train close to failure did you have hard mm -hmm. sets that you accumulated that are very potent like your body's going to adapt to that whether it shows up in the next session or not it, it usually does but sometimes it doesn't and you can't really just worry too much about a one-off like if you sleep just slightly worse or you have a little bit less food or you forget to take your creatine or these tiny little things where those little variables if you mess it up makes a, a three percent difference in your performance but your adaptation only makes a 1% difference. Now you're still a net negative in overall performance. So that's why you're going to see these little fluctuations. So uh, I think the biggest thing is just focusing on was what I just did potent. Uh, and I, am I growing in general? Because not every lift is going to be going up all the time. Like if you have, if you have two lifts for the same muscle in a session and you're increasing your performance on one lift you're now training that second lift in a more fatigued state each time in, in most cases. So sometimes that second lift might not be going up that much. And you might have to say, well, that's not necessarily an issue because I'm either maintaining or slowly increasing performance, but I'm doing that in more in a more fatigued state every week. So uh, you can't really just write off a lift entirely just because the performance isn't going up. But generally speaking, if you're, if you really are getting jacked and you're building muscle, the reps and the weights will climb up. You'll just, they'll get too light uh, or you'll just be able to handle more in a reasonable rep range and that's just more efficient. So either one of those will happen for sure. It sounds like you're not in a rush. And I think that is a skill that you have that a lot of younger lifters don't have. 
So mm -hmm. I think that probably allows you to kind of have that long-term orientation where you're like, I'm having potent stimulus. I'm doing it over and over again. I know the results will show up. Um, and I think the challenge is a lot of people are looking for things so quick that they're almost forced to feel like they need to rush uh, progression. Yeah, there's a couple there's a couple interesting talking points from there. Uh, I think part the first one is pretty simple. I think if in my mind I understand that stimulus causes growth, I almost am rushing there faster in a way because I'm just taking a different route that I think is more efficient. But I would say for for just for myself specifically, I think the reason why I can embrace that mindset in a way is because uh I started and I still kind of have to a degree just a bunch of self-doubt and I don't really believe that I can do things. And one of my main incentives and motivations is to prove myself wrong. As crazy as that sounds, that's just the way my brain works, where before I started lifting, I was skinny and I was like, oh, I could never get jacked. Like I, for some reason, I just wouldn't be able to for whatever, whatever reason it was. At the time when I was younger, I just didn't have money. Like I didn't, I'm like, oh, well, I can't go to the gym because I can't afford it. So I'm going to stay small. And that was my mindset. So when I saved up a little bit of money, bought the gym membership, I'm like, I'm going to force this to happen. I'm going to prove myself wrong, get rid of that self-doubt. And that's, I'm going to do that at any cost. And I think that's just that little mindset that I had went a long way in me being able to not be in a rush or not need things or know that I can get them and want it now is something like, I don't think I can do it. So I'm going to prove that wrong. So I didn't really have a timeline on it. Yeah, that's really cool. I feel like as you get more and more wins, you kind of become more confident because you can kind of go back in that cookie jar. But I feel yeah. like no matter what you achieve, like that self doubt is still there. And it's still a driving force. Like if it was a driving force for you younger in your life, it's still going to like show up at times and you're going to have to like work through that. I agree. Yeah. There's, there's one of those weird things where I think the same thing applies to bodybuilding where your goals can seem so out of reach before you get there. And then when you get there, you're like, Oh yeah, I, I can see how I could do that. Like, like bodybuilding. It's like, Oh, well when I was skinny, I was like, how do these people do it? How do they get jacked? This, like, there's no way I could ever do that. And then I made progress and I'm looking back. It's like, oh, yeah, I can kind of see how that happens. And then you get you just build confidence, like you said, from it. Awesome. So I want to talk about your road to 18 inch arms. So you've mentioned that you are a hypertrophy enthusiast and that simply put your favorite exercises are the ones that provide the most hypertrophy. So in that context, what is your Mount Rushmore, your favorite four arm exercises and why? Yeah, so I know two of them. I'll have to think for the next two, but it's going to be the close grip preacher curl and the Smith Machine JM press. They are length and bias lifts. They're both very stable, and the stretch is insane on the Smith JM press. I'll I'll start on this one because it has a, a very clear and obvious reason, in my opinion, why it is going to be one of the best lifts for triceps. It's because one, it's a compound lift, so the resistance profile is a little bit more even, but it's training a muscle that is usually a secondary mover on compound lifts. So if you take a dip, a bench press, even a close grip bench, your pecs are the prime movers, your front delts assist a lot. In a JM press, it's your triceps are the prime mover because it's still a compound movement. Triceps are the prime mover, front delts still work to a degree, chest works a tiny little bit, but it's mostly just in a supporting role. Uh, and it goes through a, a legit full range of motion. So if you take even a close skirt bench at the bottom of that lift, your elbow is bending maybe about this much. It's going just past that 90 degree mark. And even then, your pecs are going to be taking most of the work. When you do push downs, most people stop about right here, and then they go down. Maybe they go a little bit above. But as soon as you get to 90 degrees, in most cases, actually, usually a little bit lower than 90 degrees, this is where the resistance cuts off. I'm not going to try and explain all the resistance profiles to everybody because I don't have the proper setup to do that right now. I don't want to confuse anyone. Basically, with a tricep push down, say on a bar or rope on a cable, you can get super high, but the, the resistance profile makes it so there's basically no tension at the top. There's still a little bit, but it's not enough to really maximize that stretch. With a JM press, 
the moment arm is greatest at the bottom. So since the resistance isn't going up and down, it's going horizontal like this. Well, technically it's going up and down since you're laying down, but that's besides the point. You're basically putting max tension on your tricep when it's maximally stretched. No other lift does that. There's barely, the triceps never see any resistance in that range of motion. So the more we learn about that being a more potent range of motion that does cause a decent amount of hypertrophy, I think that just makes more and more sense why that lift is, it's hard to say if it's like specifically so much better than any other lift, because I don't really think there's anything that special in exercise selection, but I, I would put it as the best lift for triceps. Um, it's, it's more nuanced than that, but I would, if I had to pick one, I'd pick that. All right. You got three more in your Mount Rushmore. Yeah. These won't take as long, but preacher curls, it's a length and bias lift. Most curls resistance again it's the inverse of the triceps resistance is at the top when they're mostly contracted the preacher curl sets your elbow forward so peak resistance isn't a longer length the elbow support is incredible especially once you get stronger so this is more important for intermediate or advanced lifters in my opinion uh the stronger you get with a free weight curl since the weight's in front of you you have to lean back and counter that if you're curling 40 pounds in front of you it's just not that much to offset your body weight. But if you're curling 115 pounds, that's trying to pull you forwards. You have to lean back. The weight wants to come back. So you're, you're, even your chest and your front delts are trying to support the weight. It just gets to be a little bit messy. And I'm not saying it doesn't work, but that's why a preacher curl, I think, would be superior. If I had to pick two more, I would go, this is tricky. Um, I would say easy bar overhead extensions for myself personally, but they can be done with a dumbbell or a cable. Uh, with back support, ideally, I don't have that set up in the basement, unfortunately, but overhead extensions for the long head, of the tricep resistance profile isn't perfect, but, uh, it's a mid mid range biased resistance profile. It stretches out the long head. I, I think it does an excellent job of growing the long head of the tricep. And if I had to pick one more, I would say, I would say it's, I'll go I'll go Bayesian curl slash incline curl, kind of the same thing, cable versus dumbbell, but I, I would probably pick that as the next one. Yeah, I think I have some similar to you. Like I use the uh, overhead tricep extension, like with the rope, so I get yep. the stretch kind of oh, on yeah. the long head. I haven't done the Smith jam press. I've seen you do it, so I might give that a go. It's just hard to get access to the one Smith machine at my gym. Um but yeah, I agree in terms of like biasing the length in position. I'm not 100% sure on not doing a full range of motion and focusing just on partials there. But I do think getting in that deep stretch position and working there, um, you know, causes a lot of hypertrophy. Yeah, I'm not entirely sold on the partials either. That's why I don't really do them, at least for a working set. Maybe I'll do them after a set uh, as just some form of intensity technique. But yeah, I still think going through peak resistance I, I can't make any logical case in my head of why that wouldn't be worth doing. Uh, of course, there's going to be some situations where getting a full stretch or just biasing the length and position will work. But I think if you're biasing the length and position, I'd rather still go through peak resistance than just go near it or to it and reverse from there. And would you do anything for the forearms or like the brachialis? Or do you feel like that's just worked in kind of your 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 main tricep and bicep movements? Yes. Yeah, so forearms, I usually train in phases. Uh, I, the reason for that is I think they maintain fairly well through back and bicep training, but they probably won't grow that much, at least once you're more advanced. Mine haven't grown at all recently, but they have, I don't think they've lost much size. Uh, so I think training them in phases is fine. The brachialis, I think is mostly trained fine through direct bicep work that would be something where unless i particularly particularly wanted to grow it or it was a specific weak point for me then i'm personally probably fine just dedicating my volume to direct bicep work that i know works really well because i do i do try and keep volume low to moderate cool all right so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to throw some pictures on the screen and name someone and I want you to tell me something you've learned from them and then what you would train with them if you met with them in person. Okay. Yeah. Like what lift or what muscle? Whatever you want, man. It, I, I would say what muscle or what workout, like what the session would look like. So All right. the first person is Steve Shaw. Steve, I would have to train back with him. I think, uh, 
he goes hard on rows, especially dumbbell rows. We have that in common. He's big on shrugs and power shrugs, uh, rack pulls, stuff like that. So I would definitely train back with Steve. Uh, it would be, I'd include some vertical pulls. I know he prefers horizontal pulls specifically. So I'd try and get each of our strong points in there. And then I think finishing off some power shrugs, smoking the traps, I'd have a hard time not doing that with Steve. All right. Next one is uh, natural hypertrophy. Uh, we would do, we'd specifically skip abs because let's be real. I'm not quite on his level, not even close, but we would train <laughs> arms. Absolutely. Preacher curls, JM press, overhead extensions. I think we both do those three lifts pretty well. Awesome. All right. For the next one, you can pick David Krejci or you could pick Connor McDavid. Oh, come on. I got to go Krejci. I mean, he's got a cup. Look at the picture. Uh, although McDavid, he, he'll have a cup in, what's it, three months? So it's tough to pick. But you I think so? Uh, yeah, I definitely. I, I could nerd out about it. I'm, I, I spent a good, probably longer than I want to admit, portion of last Wednesday going through some nerdy hockey stats and figuring stuff out. But <laughs> that, would, that would probably take away from the fitness focused podcast i would say have to go crazy have to yeah it hurt me putting that up there because i'm a leafs fan and boston's just like just <laughs> beat up on us like through the last 20 years but uh, it was a good game last night yeah <laughs> all right uh next one gvs oh gvs i mean I'd, i have to train arms with him too his biceps are freaky his triceps are unreal i mean he's got the best triceps i've ever seen on a natural but like i i don't even think it's a competition honestly so wow. definitely a lot of overhead extensions i would do rope overhead extensions with him i know that's his kind of bread and butter for triceps i would also try and show him some jm presses if i remember correctly he said they don't really click well with him so maybe i've got a tip or trick for him so i'd and he's probably got the same for me with overhead extensions because I've actually, I don't specifically like rope overhead, ex overhead extensions either. So I'd probably uh, definitely train arms. Have That's you tried like the extra long rope? Um, I've tried similar, similar concepts to that, but for some reason I just prefer the easy bar. It's something that I can't really explain. Okay. All right. And the last one is Alpha Destiny, Alex Leonidas hex with him for sure uh i would say i'd let him take me through some bench that's his strong point so it would be cool to bench with him uh i would take him through just the gauntlet of smith pressing that i do and then some pec deck i know he likes some ring work so i think he does some ring push-ups and stuff like that and ring dips i'd i'd love to have him teach me some of that stuff kind of show me how all that works too so have to be pecs with him Awesome. Although we'd also have to hit some traps too. Can't leave that out. Yeah, you'd have to hit some traps. So Absolutely. speaking of Alex, if you could steal one piece of equipment from his gym, what would you take? Oh, from his gym? I would take... Uh, what would I take? I would consider taking his barbell because I still have a cheap... Uh, it's like a $60 bar from Dick's Sporting Goods or something. So I, I would actually consider that. Uh, other than that, I would probably consider... I think he, he has a, a cable row and lat pull down that he, I know I saw it in his gym tour. I think he uses that um, occasionally. I don't think it always stays in his gym, but I would probably take that because my lat pull down is pretty low quality to the point where I actually don't really use it much. So I'd probably take that. It's funny. He has so many different bars and you're just like, I want his classic bar because it's higher quality than mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not a barbell guy, so I'm like, I, I just give me one and I'll be fine. Cool. Um, so you mentioned that when you were in kindergarten, your entire personality was being a shark. And you also mentioned that growing your delts was your highest priority in life. I'm curious, how important do you think it is to have a singular goal or vision? Uh, I'd say it depends on what you want out of life. Um, do you want to be someone that focuses on if you have kind of like the philosophy of mastery where you are good on going all in on one thing at the expense of other areas in life then that's fine and i think you should that i think it's pretty important actually it's hard to be a, a balanced person that excels in a bunch of different things 
Uh, so I, I think at least for certain phases in life, it's okay to, to go all in and make that all you care about. Uh, it probably isn't ideal to last forever because there are going to be things that you think are important and that you value that you're going to leave on the back burner. But I also think if you're someone that doesn't have that all in mindset and you're un unable to achieve the same thing that somebody with kind of that mastery focused all in mindset has, I don't think you have any business to say that that person is lucky with genetics or mm -hmm. they take steroids, things like this, where you just, yeah, it, it gets into the whole fake natty thing where you get people that there, there are a lot of fake natties. That's not to debate that. But when you get naturals that are very advanced and have made a bunch of progress and have developed great physiques, you can't take away from somebody that went all in on that because you're not willing to. So I think that's kind of where you have to find that balance. And when you were like all in on your delts, do you feel like you sacrificed other aspects of your life to make that happen? Yeah, well, just for bodybuilding, 100%. Um, I had recently moved, so I didn't really know anybody. I had no friends or anything. I was just, this is all I care about. And that's, this is all I, this is all I could do anyways. I was kind of forced into that in a way I, I forced myself into it to take more responsibility for kind of that phase in life. But it was, uh, it was the only thing I could do. And the only thing that I let myself care about. And it's another kind of example of me just wanting to prove myself wrong. I was like, Oh, well, all these influencers who most of them were on steroids at the time, I was like, all these influencers, they have huge delts and crazy physiques. And that's not that stupid if I can't do it too, which you could make the case that maybe my genetics aren't as good as theirs. And obviously I'm natural too. So that's kind of working against me. But I was like, I'm just going to achieve that in spite of what I'm seeing with all the fake natties and whatnot. So I was just like, I'm going to build a physique that doesn't look natural. And I guess to, to my credit, that was kind of during my power building phase, but Delt training never really, and this is kind of the one thing I talk about where delt and lat training for me, like I kind of had that down. I haven't really changed much since then, but ev everywhere else was kind of a nightmare in my program and in my mindset. But delt and lat training, I, I pushed that hard and I think I did that properly. Did you know you were following fake natties at that time or did you think they were natural? No, um, I, I had a pretty good sense of who was natural and who wasn't back then. Um, but I was definitely very cornered in like the whole aesthetics community where their main focus in a physique is having a small waist one, which I think is kind of stupid because it's com like completely out of your control. Uh, and then just growing your delts, you have the craziest V taper. So I was like, all right, well, delts it is because I, I don't have a small waist and there's nothing I can do about that. So I'll focus on the delts and just get those as big as I possibly can in order to have a physique of the people that I follow and what was popular at the time. That's cool. So do you feel like you have more of a balance now between uh, bodybuilding or is it still like in phases? Because I feel like life is more like juggling where there's one ball in your hand and you kind of go at it and then maybe something else comes and you focus on it. I find it hard to focus on five things at the same time. Yeah. Um, I would say I'm probably at a point now where it's just, it's such an ingrained habit, just lifting and bodybuilding to where no matter how motivated or unmotivated I am, I can still have a great workout and make progress how I always do. So I feel like I'm in a spot where I can, if needed, or if I just want to, I can kind of, kind of put it on the back burner mentally, but physically nothing really changes. Um, which I, I'm, I'm happy to be in that spot for sure. Cause it does let me bring more balance into my life. And I'm someone that like, my life isn't that balanced. Like I went all in on lifting and bodybuilding and, uh, more recently just like the YouTube channel. So. I've sacrificed other areas of my life in favor of that. And now that I'm a little older and I kind of have those things more secured, it allows me to kind of focus on other areas if I have other interests where before I've, I've always struggled to, to keep that balance. I don't think you can start something new with balance. I think when you start something new, you have to kind of go all in somewhat to kind of build that habit and 
ingrain it as part of your identity. And then over time, once it's there, I think you can kind of ease back. But I think it's hard to be like, I really want to get into it, but I'm also, you know, doing these four other things at the same level. Um, so I yeah. think it's a timing thing. Yeah, you have to be curious too. So yeah, I think you're right about timing, but you have to like, you have to want to learn. You have to want to at least see what you can achieve. Like, I, I don't understand how people can say, oh, I want this great physique, but I'd rather go out to eat and skip the gym. It's like, well, you're not, you're not keeping it high enough on your priority list. Like, are, are do you, how bad do you really want it is kind of my question there. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's one of those things where you have, you have to be curious. And I think the, the most successful people are curious people that really want to experiment and understand things that they don't understand and haven't experimented with right now. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some things you've said or some quotes and give me your first reaction as to what it means to you. I think this first one just touches on what we were saying. So the first is you can't be a passive lifter. Yeah, you you have to go get it. That's the way I see it. You have to go get it. Uh, you have to you have to just want it so bad. There's there's it's so hard to expand on that. It's like you just have it or you don't. You have to be assertive. You can't be passive. And if you want something, you have to make it happen. Your mind is so powerful. You're in control of so much more than you think you are and prove any doubt you have wrong. Yeah, I think it comes back to that curiosity thing, right? Like if you're curious, you'll kind of see like, what's the next step? Can I investigate yes. here? And sometimes you won't find anything. And sometimes you'll find something really exciting. And then you have a rabbit hole. You get to go down for a few days and it's, it's exciting yeah. during that time. I agree. You find yeah, a new channel cool. or you find a new anything. You're like, this is great. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the next one is I purposely put myself at a disadvantage in terms of strength for every lift I do. Yeah, so this is focusing on stimulus. If you put yourself at a disadvantage for strength, it's hard to have an ego with your numbers. So if I'm doing a pause Smith machine bench with a slightly closer grip, my ego can't handle myself caring about strength because I know I can do more. So mm. if I put myself at a little disadvantage in favor of stimulus, I'm already disassociating my mindset from maximum performance at all costs. And now that I don't have that, that opens up more mental capacity to focus on something like stimulus, which ultimately I think is the reason why I progress faster, even though I don't really focus on progressive overload as a, as a top priority. Yeah, that's interesting because I notice sometimes if I notice my forms getting poor on a lift, what I'll do is, you know, I'll lower the weight, but I might change the rep scheme as well. So instead of yeah. doing like six to eight, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do like 12 to 16. And then I don't have to think about like, oh, last week I did this much because now it's like a new lift to me. And I get yeah. to just start from the baseline with good form and I get to just progress over it and kind of milk those gains over the next few months. Totally. Yeah. It's the same thing with adding, even just adding weight too, where it's like, all right, well, I have nothing to compare this to. So why don't I just make the best technique and the best set that I possibly can. And then it gets, it gets intimidating when you've been at a certain weight for a while and you have an eye on performance and you're like, uh, I have to add another rep. So you kind of rush your first rep. So you don't spend energy. You kind of rush your second rep. So you have more in the tank towards the end of the set you pause between your second to last rep and your last rep. And then you take another pause and you rush a final rep and you grind it up and you kind of count it. It's like, that's not really progressive overload. Yeah. No one cares what you're doing in the gym, right? You're doing it for yourself. So if you're doing it for yourself, then you need to be confident that you did the best job you did at the gym, as opposed to I increased my logbook as much as possible, or I, I hit this imaginary number I wanted to hit. Yeah. And it all comes down to what you want to get out of it. Like if you want to be a power lifter and it doesn't matter how you lift, as long as you're within the rules of the powerlifting federation you're competing in, then that's all good. But that there's no reason for that to apply to lifters that aren't seeking to be power lifters. I think if you're just looking to grow. It yeah, doesn't make and I don't think most people want to be power lifters. If you want to be a power lifter, go for it. Right. If you want to be a bodybuilder, follow those standards. But if you just care about Whatever you care about as an individual, align yourself with whatever your own goals are and go after it. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think people see the big three as like a measuring stick. And I think that interests people. But I think as far as like competitive powerlifting goes, I think, I think that's super, I think that's super niche. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the next quote is the bad place is living through someone else. Yeah. That's probably an old quote, huh? I've it is. I remember thinking about that quite a bit when I started the channel because one of my main philosophies of the channel is I don't want people to live through me. So I was like, I'm not just going to do like the generic vlogs where I show people my life and they live through me because I remember being in that, even during that all out bodybuilding phase where I just watch like training vlogs. And then when I was ready to go to the gym, it felt like I had already accomplished going to the gym and my motivation would be lower. So uh, not that I couldn't get through a workout and make it productive, but I felt like I was going through the motions still, still productively, but I felt like psychologically, I just, I, I had spent energy that way. So I think having a channel where I can help people enhance what they're doing rather than just letting them witness myself is important. Cool. All right. So you mentioned you saw Theo Vaughn live and it made you reflect on the size of your YouTube channel. First of all, he's hilarious. Uh, so, but secondly, how important has community been for you and your lifting journey? And what's your experience been being part of the Noble Natty community? Yeah, um, I would say it was, yeah, so that uh, that show was interesting because I think it was the same amount of people there as I had subscribed to the channel, which I don't remember maybe it was 14,000, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what, what I was at back then, but just seeing all those people is kind of crazy. I was like, wow. I mean, in the big picture, when I'm comparing myself to the top 1% of YouTube channels that have 100,000 plus subscribers, that's my channel seems and feels very small. But when you actually look at the numbers objectively without comparing them to anything else, it just shows that people care about the channel and it has a big impact. So that's that was kind of the final point where I was like, I really just don't care that much about the numbers and the growth of the channel. It's more so just there's already, this is already a great channel as far as like the community goes. So what it, is it just getting greedy if I chase views from now on? And that's, and it's at the expense of what I give to the people that are already in the community and already support me. And I know you asked about the whole noble natty thing too. I, I just have to give props to the other creators here because they accepted me as soon as I started making videos where usually to not only just be accepted, but gain respect, you have to do a lot. And especially on a competitive platform like YouTube, where it, you risk losing followers and that you can go down the chain of that and that might turn into financial loss by sh giving out other channels for people to follow. And it's technically other competition if you look at it from like a business or view standpoint, but uh, you can tell how genuine these people are and how much they care about lifting because they're willing to add to the community, which in turn shrinks their voice almost in a way. Uh, you could say you can make a counterpoint to that where adding more people makes the community bigger and we'll all grow together. But I think at the same time, it's people, they don't, they don't view me as competition. They view me as someone that can help out and join the lifting community, which I thought was cool. Um, and yeah, they're, they're all just, they, they have great channels and they're, they're like life changing. I think for a lot of serious lifters, if you really go back and look at a lot of these guys content, um, yeah, it, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool community to be a part of, even if it is still kind of niche and small and whatever. Yeah, it's definitely really niche and small, but it's a great community. I was just at the uh, the Arnold, and it yep. made me realize how small the community was. And, yep. you know, there's lineups of like 600 people with, you know, the broccoli hair waiting for Sam Selleck in a yep. line. And I'm like, okay, like, I guess you have to go pretty deep into YouTube to actually find this content. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's... It's true. I mean, you start off and you get a, uh, you get some of the bigger channels and you like in reference, I I've calculated the numbers out too, just to put it in perspective. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I was comparing like, all right, well, Athlean X has had 
like his three most recent videos have had more views than my entire channel combined and just little things like that. And I'm like, yeah. his, he has like 400 times as many subscribers as I do or some, something like that. It's probably even more than that, but just those numbers, I'm like, it shows how big some of those channels really are. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, and he has 400 times the amount of this is killing your gains videos as well. Maybe 4,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do have one of those now. I, I made a video, I think, a week or two ago saying this is the actual thing. <laughs> killing your gains. And that, was, that was the video about being a passive lifter. So, But it's funny. I, I was interviewing people, um, just chatting with them in regarding their fitness jersey, uh, journey. And a lot of them like, yeah, like I follow Athlean X. And then I named a bunch of YouTubers like never heard of them. Like yeah. they never heard of like Jeff Nippard. I'm like, oh, interesting. So it's interesting. Yeah. And like, he's a pretty big YouTuber, but it's like, nope, just Athlete X and yeah. equivalent. So, you know, that's more for the average, I, I guess, gym goer. Yeah. Well, I can see, I can see how Athlete X's titles and content is super appealing to uh, people that haven't lifted yet or beginner lifters. It makes a lot of sense. I remember being a beginner lifter and being super interested by his content because it, I guess it's marketing or branding, but it looks super official. Uh, it looks like really well thought out and well put together. Like he, it looks like you are on a channel of like the top strength coach of or bodybuilding coach of the planet. Uh, and I guess props to him for that. But then I guess there there is good content on that channel too. But I think at the same time, clearly for a long time, there were fundamentals of lifting that probably got overlooked quite a bit in favor of more biomechanic form type stuff which they're both important but i think he was probably biasing one of those a little bit too much for sure so i want to talk about you know your youtube channel they say when people start something they either do it as a mercenary or a missionary i get the vibe that you're more of a missionary would you agree to that and maybe detail why you started your channel yeah well i guess the I would say the reason I started my channel is because I I felt I almost felt the need to where I saw the natural movement starting to come up a little bit and I was like I have value to add to that community and there's an audience for it and it feels weird to not put my experience into that in, in community so I felt compelled to do it uh it's it just felt like the right time, right place and the right story. And I, I think I, I there's the content that I've created is stuff that I think is pretty new. Um, obviously not everything. I'm not like some revolutionary guy with all this new magic for lifting and whatnot. But uh, I think my experience is unique. And I think it's important for people to understand so they don't get too carried away with the progressive overload. I think the community was skewed way towards strength powerlifting, that kind of stuff for way too long. And I think it was dumbed down. I think it was oversimplified. And I think we lost kind of the love for attention to detail with hypertrophy training or bodybuilding in general. So my goal was always just to bring back that, bring back the attention to detail and the passion instead of the reductionist mindset of just get stronger. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to finish today off with what I think is kind of a fun question. So you've mentioned that you're a big fan of The Walking Dead. So tell me, what's the difference between a good and a great zombie apocalypse show or movie? Huh. So I would say, I actually, I think The Walking Dead has kind of been on both sides of the spectrum. They've been pretty bad and they've been pretty good too. It would be, I guess what, what would make it bad is obviously a, a lacking storyline. That's a very simple answer, but I'd say, if there's no clear no clear end goal or storyline that they're working towards, then I think the show gets a little bit you you can lose interest in that pretty quick. And I think The Walking Dead started to work towards that towards the end, or at least since season probably seven, eight, nine. I actually didn't even watch season ten or eleven because it was so boring. Uh, but I'd say what makes it good, there's so many things that make it good, but I guess I'd have to say how almost realistic it was and that sounds crazy at first but in terms of how they how they reacted to the situation that they were in and that's that's for me what makes it good because 
it's a completely unrealistic situation. At least I think, I hope. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope so really. <laughs> but uh, the way they responded to it seemed very realistic and it seemed very human um, where they actually, everything was realistic in their response. And you could, you could say that in any way, like where they decided to go, how they decided to, get food, how their emotional well-being was, how they communicated with each other, their sense of urgency, little things like that is what kept me engaged because it almost is an alternate reality, but it feels like reality. And I think there's some shows where it's just so unrealistic to the actual human experience that it just, Mm. it seems more like fiction where The Walking Dead, I think it has that non-fiction factors just an unrealistic situation but the way the humans interact with it is so realistic and i think the acting was just great yeah i fell off maybe at like season six or seven i found the human part was great i also found that the zombies were scary and intimidating and i think that was really important but later in the show they seem like they were non-issues like you're like yeah humans are going to kill humans but you're not going to die from a zombie at that point and I feel yeah. like that's where it kind of shifted for me. I think the zombies always need to be a threat. Um, and I feel like they stop being a threat at some point. I agree. Well, I think they I think they could have done it properly, but I don't think they did. So I think with that show where, like you said, when you get to season seven, roughly, it just turns into it's it's human conflict. And it's just it's very basic politics of when you're probably starting out a new world or a new country or whatever. And they could have made it better, but it turned into a little bit too sci-fi fantasy uh, compared to what it initially was. So when you start the show off with a very, say, traditional Southern American family, he's a cop and is, I don't remember what his wife did or anything, but they've got two kids, he's got a Mm -hmm. son, and they just live a very standard life and they meet normal people like his friends that are cops and whatnot. And then you turn into like somebody that, thinks they have a kingdom and they walk around with a with a tiger and it's like this doesn't seem it it just didn't flow right it felt like you were watching a different show so i think they could have done it properly but they they had to keep that same level of realisticness in the human aspect for each camp and then had the you can have the social conflict and the political stuff from there but they just turned it into a different show and i know i know you have a game of thrones uh poster picture i do I do. I I haven't seen Game of Thrones, but uh, kind kind of uncommon, I guess. But I've heard it's it's been compared to that show in the sense that it's not comparable in terms of quality. But they're trying to go for that kind of show, I guess. Yeah, I think it was a similar show where the first few seasons were just fantastic, and then yeah, I still enjoyed it, but it kind of fell apart. But you know what do you can do? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's I think that's sometimes where you don't always want to drag things out for too long. Like sometimes it's better just to end it and keep, don't let the peak decline. Like, I don't, I don't know if you ever saw, I don't know if you saw breaking bad, but to me, that's the best example of a show that was just good throughout. And they ended it at the right time. Yeah. So I've seen most of it. Uh, I actually do want to finish the show. And then even going back to a hockey example, you could say Krejci and Bergeron where they retired not when they were just like being third and fourth liners, they retired at the end of their peak, I would say. And then they're just going to have a great legacy. They'll have a great career where maybe someone like say, I don't know, Jeff Carter or someone like that, where they just career out for so long. Like he had a great prime, but it will be forgotten because people will only remember how his career ended. So I I think remember like his 40 goal seasons, like hit a few of them. Yeah. Yeah, and those will probably be forgotten because it's been so he's been playing so many seasons in the meantime for obviously so many years that haven't been as productive. So that almost waters down the career, I think. For sure. Also, Landon, thank you so much for your time today. Where can everyone find you? Yeah, uh, YouTube is Basement Bodybuilding. Instagram is basement.bodybuilding. And that's all I've got for social media. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah, thanks, Rune.